Um, I but before that, I want to try to depress you horribly, which is by bringing up a topic that you brought up, which is corporatism. Uh, in some ways, we seem to be heading for the worst of both worlds. We don't have a, a, a government doing the right thing, staffed by noble civil servants. We have the government uh, regulating a group of favored corporations uh, who are of lim a lim limited number, uh, and they're sort of cozy, and they don't allow new entrants, and, but, and the, the, those corporations get special privileges and also special responsibilities. Uh, there, there's, there are many ways we end up with this. We have one, one obvious way is if, if banks are too big to fail or General Motors is too big to fail, you just can't let them fail. Then they, if they do fail, the government ends up owning them. And then the government has a player in the industry. So if the government owns GM, is it going to let Ford put GM out of business? <laughs> I don't think so. A uh, second way is uh, industrial policy. If we really think it's really important that we have enough uh, knowledge about chip technology that we can make the next generation of computer chips, then we can't let Intel fail. Or if Intel's about to fail, we have to subsidize somebody, maybe it's 100 firms, it doesn't have to be one, uh, to maintain the knowledge of chip technology so we can com compete in the future. And the third way, obvious way, is environmental regulation. You, you see that in California. We want clean gas. It imposes huge costs on refiners, so we only have four or five refiners and they have an oligopoly and they can jack up prices and we don't have competition. So we have the worst of both worlds. We have all the inequality of competition without the efficiency. And what I want to suggest is that this is inevitable. It's not something that's easily fixed unless you guys have an easy fix. Easily fixed. <laughs> not easy to get there, but once we get there. 30 seconds or less, you're right. Uh, get government out of, the, out of the business of business. If government is out of the business of business, cronyism goes away. Uh, when Microsoft uh, was in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know how much money Microsoft spent on lobbying in DC every year? Zero, nothing. And it was Alan Hatch, a Republican, by the way, who harassed them because of it. He used to have committees where he'd bring the Microsoft people in to harass them because they weren't lobbying. To this day, uh, Apple is being harassed now because they're not lobbying enough, right? Uh, how much money does Microsoft spend today on lobbying? Tens of millions of dollars. Because the Justice Department proved to them that they better lobby, otherwise they're going to get screwed. So I think the way to do it is to massively deregulate, do away with all the privileges and the benefits, do away with things like too big to fail. But you can't just do away with too big to fail. You have to do away with all of the financial regulations, including um, deposit insurance, let the, let the private market provide deposit insurance if there is such a market for it. Uh, let, let banks be rated and people decide where to deposit their money. As long as you have regulations and as long as you have preferred tax rates, you will get lobbying. And as long as you get lobbying, you will get cronyism. No matter what the election reform is, no matter how you take, try to take money out of politics, they'll find other ways to get into politics. The only way to get cronyism, corporatism out of the way is to allow for true free markets. And the only way to do that is to get rid of government involvement in the economy. And, and you know, if I had to rewrite the Constitution now, I'd have not only a separation of church and state, but a separation of economics and state. Let the state stay out of the business of business. Good luck with that agenda as long as we have the campaign finance system we have where corporations and wealthy interests can spend virtually as much money as they want to influence politics and elections and policy making. I mean, one of the reasons we have, and I think that Yaron and I would, I'm glad you raised this, this, this issue, Mickey, because I think it is an area where, where there's the need for some real change. And Yaron and I would uh, agree in, in some respects that there's too much uh, government involvement in, in picking winners and losers and in, in, in subsidizing certain industries over, over others. And that is definitely problematic. And, but I think it, it is a major reflection of, of uh, the, uh, partly the, the amount of money in politics. I mean, the, the reason that these, the, 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 the reason these subsidies exist is because they were created by, by powerful special interests and defended by these interests who have basically bought our politicians and our political process. And I don't think that we're going to be able to do any of the, I mean, just take tax reform. I mean, to, to, 
change our tax system to get rid of all these special breaks and loopholes for corporations and various uh, industries, uh, it's going to be very hard as long as, you know, our capital is besieged by lobbyists, as long as there's 100 lobbyists for every elected representative, as long as it costs $20 million to, to win a, a Senate campaign, as long as it costs $3 billion to run a presidential election in this country. I mean, this is insane. It's a total perversion of our, of our democracy. So you're on. I'm with you. But unless we deal with the money and politics problem, we're not going to get anywhere. Well, but you're not with me. I mean, you, you just want to change the subsidies and give subsidies to industries you believe should be subsidized. No, no, that's not true. So we'll, I'm, I'm happy to get rid of all subsidies to all, all subsidies industries. To business, all of all subsidies. Great. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, let's uh, take some questions from the audience. Sir, are you in back it's actually a mic, and since we're, I think we're oh. live streaming this, if you could go up to the mic and maybe stand in line in the mic, that would really help. Usually when you have an open mic, only 9-11 truthers line up. But, uh, <laughs> I'm taking a chance with you. No, I think we're OK. <laughs> so I have a question for Don, is it? David. David? Yes. OK. Um, I, something that seemed strange to me was that you seem to be um, denying free will in terms of, of jobs, you, you, that, that people must rise and fall with the economy. I don't have a college education. I'm making more now than I have ever. And uh, I educated myself in my field. And you seem to be saying that these people were, were uh, required to stay at the skill level that they are, that they could not improve their own skill level by their own effort. Um, so th that was odd to me. But what uh, my real question is, is y you seem to be saying that these, these workers have a right to a job um, that someone else has created. So I, I, do employers then, in your view, have a right to employees? Because I'm an employer, and yeah. I would like to have more employees than I do, but I have to compete with other organizations that can pay more than I do. Um, and if an employer has a right to employees, I mean, how, it, how is it different than slavery if someone is, is enforced to either work for someone or to... I mean, if the employer is forced to employ, it yeah. seems that that's forced employment of themselves. They're, they're a slave to their employees. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's great that you've done so well and educated yourself, and, and that's, that's fantastic. Um, and I certainly believe in free will. I, I believe that, that people who work hard and make a greater effort and are more creative and resourceful can do better, and that, and that we're not just completely creatures of, of, of structural circumstances. I, be I believe that in the real world, structures matter and the big economic forces matter and individual effort matters and what we do as individuals matter. Um, and, uh, but for, for, for many people, the structural forces are, 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 uh, are, are so powerful that their own individual effort is just not good enough to change their situation, that, that they may not have the options. You know, if, you're, uh, if, if, if you live in Toledo and you've lived there your whole life and you're 58 years old and your kids are in, in the public schools and you lose your job, you don't necessarily, you can't necessarily move to, uh, uh, you know, Alabama or something or go start and become a, uh, you know, uh, get, go in the fracking industry of North Dakota. You don't have complete, choice and freedom, and that's just a, a reality. I mean, I, I think everybody can relate to this reality that sometimes we have the ability to reinvent ourselves, and other times we're kind of stuck. And that, in my mind, is where government needs to, to step in to deal with economic disasters and disruptions that ordinary people d are, are caught up in for no fault of their own. And it's not that I want to force you to have to hire, employee, hire employees. What I would like to see is during these economic disasters with high unemployment, thousands of millions of people who are idle, I would like to see government do useful things that need to be done, like, for example, rebuilding our infrastructure. I mean, there's you know, 60,000 bridges in America are said to be in, 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 in serious disrepair. There's been estimates we need to spend $200 billion a year on infrastructure over the next decade. Construction workers have the highest unemployment rate right now at 12%. 
interest rates are at all time low, boy, this seems to be a good time to take all those idle construction workers and put them to work fixing all those bridges by borrowing money at historically low Do I have to pay rate. for that though? I, I, Absolutely you do, and you should. If you're smart, you will, because you will do better, your business and you economically will do better in a country that has strong infrastructure. Look at the Chinese investing in high-speed rail, investing in the, the sophisticated ports, investing in, the air, in, their, in their air control system. Look at the South Koreans who have 98% broadband penetration because of their government leadership. You want to live in a country where we're behind uh, most of the advanced nations of the world when it comes to rail, when it comes to internet, when it comes to scientific research? I don't think so. Actually, I just want well, the opportunity. Go ahead. Very, you know, we have 12% uh, unemployment among construction workers. Why? Because government decided in the 1990s and 2000s that we needed to get 70% of Americans into homes and massively subsidized home building across the country. So people switched professions from real production, from <sighs> producing real goods, and went to build homes, which is a consumption item, it's not an investment, it's not production, in a bubble. A bubble created by this massive government investment into something. So the reason we have these unemployed construction workers is because we perverted our economy to begin with by government. If government had stayed out of it, we wouldn't be in the mess that we are in today. Sure, infrastructure is great. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the Chinese are this living example, and right now they're doing really well, so everybody's pointing at them. It's going to be interesting because the same people, not David necessarily, but generally, were pointing at Japan in the 1980s. So I'm kind of curious to see what happens in the decades to come as China implodes in probably the largest bubble in human history uh, because it's so centralized. The regions in China that are doing phenomenally well of uh, those reasons in China where they have left people alone. And as uh, Steve Wynn says, today it's easier, less regulated, less controlled to do business in China than it is in the United States. So in those regions where government stays out of it, they're doing very well. And, and we'll see what happens to others. But I, I just want to say one thing about moving from Toledo, Ohio, because this to me is absurd. In the 19th century, people got onto their carts Cots in the in a you know if they were Jews in the shtetl in Poland they'd never been outside of a square kilometer probably they they went from central uh, Russia uh, poor poor people in 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 uh, Ireland who'd never been outside of their village were willing to get on boats to go to a safety net to social security to Medicare no to a place where all they had was freedom where all they had was opportunity where nothing was guaranteed. And they gave up, they, in those days, if you moved from Toledo somewhere, you never saw your family again. I mean, people who moved from Europe to the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century, many of them never saw their families again because transportation was so expensive and so difficult. So you have to move from Toledo to Alabama. I mean, how horrific is that? <laughs> God forbid that you would have to do that. I mean. If you, if you care about pursuit of happiness, you go where, the ha where you're going to be able to pursue your happiness. You go where the jobs are. You go where you need to be. And there's no right, God-given right, or anybody's right, to live in Toledo, Ohio, or to live anywhere, or to have employers who are committed to employing people in Toledo, Ohio. What if the employers have all moved to Lubbock, Texas? You're going to keep them in Toledo as, you know, you're right, slavery, because we need to keep people in Toledo? I mean, it's... Let's, next question for questioner. Sorry. Hi, I had a question for David. David, of all the things that you want government to do, uh, two questions. First, do you acknowledge that it represents the initiation of force against innocent people? Number two is, do you care? Because all of these things that you're advocating, you know, involve taking money by force or coercion. Coercion is, well, we're, we won't show up with a gun today. We'll send you a warning letter, but eventually we will or you know, being forced into all these nifty social programs you have, like Social Security, because to me, force is a central issue. And when I debate socialists, I bring it up and they just kind of look the other way. <laughs> so don't look the other way. Do you acknowledge that you're advocating the initiation of force against people or not, or don't you acknowledge that? Well, I uh, don't believe that when, when we do things together that that is a form of force. I mean, you're talking about I, I don't want to be part of your program, so I'm not, yeah, I'm well, not together you, with you. What, 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 what you want is democracy a la carte. You no, want I want freedom. 
Right, which, which is basically democracy a la carte. You want to be able to have agree with some laws and not others. You want to be able to- Yeah, the to laws that initiate force are the ones I'm not going to agree with. <laughs> well, I mean, most laws, ulti all laws ultimately depend upon some element of force, yes. And that we as a, we as a democracy work together. And Iran has this whole thing about, well, it's the majority can just tell us what to do anytime we want. Well, True. the founders set up a country with a lot of checks and balances. I mean, we have, a, we have a system where it's very hard for the majority to just wave a magic wand and make something happen. And we have a Bill of Rights, which was designed to ensure that no matter how much power the majority had, they could never take away certain inalienable rights that, that people have. So this, this, I mean, this is the beauty of- So you of acknowledge the, that it's initiation of force? Let's, let's I add the, 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 this, this- Yes or no? It's not the initiation of force. It is the implementation of a social contract, which is the basis <laughs> for a civilization. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's go to the next one. We have a monopoly right. on- It's too hard for me to answer. debate here. Everybody enforce it by excluding um, everybody. You know, this is not a question, this is just uh, kind of a personal statement of mine, uh -huh. which I think is relevant to this. Uh, I was born in India, and uh, uh, for the first few years of my life, we were very poor. Uh, my father then joined a corporation called Godrej. You must have heard about it. It's one of the top, you know, kind of uh, uh, companies in the world now. And uh, he, he joined that. He was a mechanical engineer, which he basically became by studying under street lights in Bombay. Uh, he had he had no money. He was studying under streetlights. Someone took him in. Uh, he 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 went from the he basically ran away from his village, came to Bombay, studied under streetlights, became a mechanical engineer, joined this company, and stayed in that company for about 35 or 40 years. And that company provided education to me at a rate that was much less than any of the other schools that were around us that were private or public with the incentive that when they would train me, when they would educate me, I would hopefully join their company, which many other people who graduated with me are still working in Godrej right now as top engineers. So their investment paid off, and that was an investment in my education, and that is why I uh, could get that education, I could go on, I, I, I could go to college, getting to your point about moving from Toledo to Alabama, I moved from India to Russia because you know there was you know I mean I mean there were, there were circumstances that I had to move away. I was away from my family for seven years, and uh, I had to survive basically on the street almost in Russia because I was incredibly poor. Then I came here, and then based on nobody's help really, I I, I got to where I am today. I'm a psychiatrist. So what you know what what I, what I want to say is that if you leave people alone to what they are capable of doing, and if you let the company that hires you do what it is supposed to do to incentivize your production, you can make people get much further in life than any government program would. That's just what I want to say. Thank you. Let's try to get as many questions in as possible. So I have a quick question yes. to both yes. of them. How do you think Europe and Greece are doing? <laughs> Go ahead, David. Uh, well, not so well right now. I mean, they, they have suffered a, suffered a major uh, real estate crash and, you know, have, have done very poorly. But Why? You know, remember, remember that a lot of the countries right now that are running major deficits uh, were running surpluses just a few years ago. So this notion that they were going along with a completely unsustainable uh, economic and social model is, is not true because... A, before the crash, a lot of them were doing just fine. That's not and true. and I might add, and I might add that the countries of the countries of Northern Europe, Germany, Denmark, the Scandinavian countries, those countries are doing, which have a very expansive social safety net, which you know pay for have subsidized college education, which have fantastic infrastructure. Those countries have export surpluses. They have lower unemployment than the United States. They've had higher growth than the United States for the past three years. So the implication of your question, which is that an expansive social safety net is incompatible with strong prosperity or economic growth, um, I think is just empirically proven wrong by the countries of Northern Europe. You look at the countries of Southern Europe, which have been basket cases in 
for, for decades for many reasons because of dysfunctional political systems, deep corruption, pervasive tax evasion, and you cite them as some sort of example of why uh, humane capitalism in a mixed economy doesn't work, that's just, that's specious reasoning. So, first There's, of all, well, just one other Southern, thing, though. Because of what they're doing right now, they also have one other big, very big problem because of their social programs, and that's the Islamic extremist problem that they have. In Europe, is going down before we do. So, Southern European countries were all running deficits for a very long time. They were living they way were. beyond their means. Uh, they were I'm paying okay. salaries that they could not afford. Their public sectors were ballooning. Uh, out of control. This is a story in Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal, not so much in Ireland, uh, where it was a real estate crash. And uh, Ireland, the problem was that they guaranteed all the deposits once the crash happened, which was really to save German banks. So uh, the whole system in Europe is broken. This is not a Southern Europe problem. That is a myth. Uh, the only reason, you know why they're saving Greek, uh, Greece, why they care about Greece? I mean, why don't they just let it go? Uh, the reason they're saving Greece is because if Greece goes under, all the German banks go under, and if the German banks go under, then Germany suddenly looks like Greece because it has to bail its own banks out and it can't afford to do so. So they, they believe that the cheapest way to save German banks is to save Greece. This is the same reasoning why we saved Mexico in 86. We didn't save Mexico because we care about Mexico. We don't. We saved Mexico to save Citibank. It goes back to your corporatism and your, and your everything because Citibank was holding those bonds. Um, and we were committed, of course, to saving because it was too big to fail. Um, but there's a myth about Northern Europe, and, and, and this is the myth. You know, Sweden is, Sweden is the best example of this. Uh, Sweden was an incredibly socialist country uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s, and it was fast going bankrupt. Indeed, uh, Sweden, uh, hit a, uh, hit a Sweden was Greece in the early 1990s. Uh, it was about to go bankrupt. And Sweden has completely transitioned over the last 20 years, not completely, but radically transitioned from the old Sweden to where we are today. It has shrunk the amount of uh, money the government spends as a percentage of GDP. It has lowered regulation. It is, is one of the fastest countries in the world in terms of deregulation. And it is moving in a direction that is the opposite of the direction of the United States. Uh, Yes, Sweden still spends more than we do as a percentage of GDP, but it's only by a few points. It's not that big of a deal anymore. They spent something like 48%. We spent, if you include state and all the other stuff, we spent 42%. So the gap is not that big. Um, Sweden is heading in the right direction. We're heading in the wrong direction. But the bigger myth is that Project 20, you know, we talk about unfunded liabilities in the United States for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Nobody talks about the unfunded liabilities the Germans have for their baby boom generation. Nobody talks about the unfunded liabilities that Northern Europeans have. In 15 years, they will look very much like Greece. They cannot afford the social programs that they have. Uh, they're just waiting, you know, they're just postponing like we are. We're living today without thinking about tomorrow. They're living in the same uh, trend. Europe as a continent, as economies, including the Germans, are basically bankrupt today just like we are, and because of the kind of policies that David would like to expand. Okay. Um, this question is more for Yaron, but feel free to chime in. Um, I understand that government is there to protect us from coercion, but are there any gray areas where it doesn't necessarily protect us from coercion, but perhaps they uh, ensure a more orderly society or prevent anarchy, or that require vast resources or centralized resources such as government? Let me throw out some examples. Let's say municipal zoning laws or the issuance, the issuing of marriage licenses, um, the building of interstate highways, or even, um, and this is an education the institution of a core curriculum that teaches the Constitution in every school across America so that there's a sense of civic duty and individual rights in students. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, I don't think there is. I think uh, it either qualifies under the protection of individual rights. And, and the only, you know, the way in which to see this is, is you do need a judiciary. You need things like a patent office because of property rights. You need a registrar for property. But there's no reason government has to get involved in the specifics of a contract like a marriage. That is a contract. It's a, it's a type of contract. Um, and, and you could create a lot of different types of contract that look very similar to today's marriage contract that the government should still uphold. They should set the, the framework 
of what does a proper contract objectively look like and leave us alone to contract freely under those guidelines. Uh, what were the other examples? Um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to get into the whole infrastructure question because we're so far from that, right? I mean, let's have that debate when we get to, you know, that's all government does. But I really believe, and I know it's hard to show, and David will make fun of me, I really believe that privately funded and created infrastructure, including roads, would be far more rational, far better, uh, you know, would have a lot less distortions, would create cities that are more manageable and more logical in their structure than a centralized authority that says we need a highway from here to there and we want to create suburbs, why, who knows. Uh, you know, so I, I, now we live with the subway system, we go, well, how could we have gotten this without government? I've got a lot, I could, I, we could go on about the railway system and how government destroyed that and then had to build, build the, the highway system in order to compensate for the fact that they destroyed the railways. And you could go on and on. But the point is that in all of those realms, I believe that a private solution would be a better solution and would be the right solution because to go back to our previous questionnaire, we're against coercion, we're against force. And every one of those issues would require force in some way or another. And I'm just against force. And once you extract force from society, how exactly the things all work out, I don't know. <clears throat> Hi, I find myself listening to both of you feeling depressed. I feel that neither <laughs> of them are, are dealing with the uh, inherent weaknesses of each of your positions. Um, David, I, you haven't addressed at all the cronyism, to bar borrow your own term, of bureaucracy and unions specifically the, uh, the notion that bureaucracies for form to solve a problem, but after a while, they have to keep that problem alive in order to keep themselves alive. And, uh, and, and your own, you know, there's, there's so many things you said that I just, just the assumptions that you make that just seem kind of crazy to me, starting with the empirical evidence that you referred to in the beginning that the poor are better in certain circumstances than other, but I don't even want to go there. I, I'm curious to know about a government that, that wants to be small government, but is inherently big government. A big army is big government. Big, big police forces, big government. Big judiciary systems, big government. Who is going to regulate the corporations? I, you know, I remember uh, reading Ayn Rand as a, as a, as, uh, as a uh, high school student, and, and she was talking about, gov about corporations self-regulating themselves because they saw the value of keeping themselves in the long term. But corporations today are all about quarterly returns. They're not about the, the big picture. What's going to, how, how is that going to, to actualize itself? Who do you want to go first? I'll, uh, I'll go first, I'll be happy you. to. Um, wow, I mean this myth of corporations being about the next quarter. Now, we don't have a free market today, and corporations are distorted, and there's cronyism, and granted all that. But this notion that American corporations are short term drives me nuts, because it is so untrue. Look at the amount of money that corporations invest in R&D. They invest more in R&D in the United States than any other country in the world by far. That is a long-term investment. Look at Apple. Apple today announced, uh, let me finish. Apple yesterday announced products. When were those products put into development? Years ago, they were thinking long-term. Um, Exxon, Exxon makes gazillions of dollars one year. Where do you think those profits go to? What percentage of that profit goes into further oil exploration? You know how long it takes from the time you, you, you decide to drill to the time you get the actual oil? You know how many decades that process can sometimes take? The idea that corporations are not long-term investors and don't care about the long-term is ludicrous. Now, in a world in which government is on your shoulder and regulating you to death, and it's, the regulations are changing. We still, by the way, don't know what the regulations of Dodd-Frank are because they haven't been written yet. Uh, there, there are thousands of these things. They change on an annual basis. Yes, corporations become shorter term. The more status you become, the more regulations you have, the more government you have, the more short term corporations are going to become. It, under freedom, corporations have to think short term, long term because shareholders are going to demand that they think long term because that's, the, that's how share prices are determined. I'm a finance guy. Share prices in a, in a free market are determined by the present value of future cash flows. Not about earnings tomorrow, but about earnings over the next 10 years, discounted, so you care less about the 10 year from now than you do about next quarter, but you still care about it. And that's how corporations, good corporations, run themselves even today. But in freedom, 
All of them would run that way, otherwise they would be driven out of business. That's why you have hostile takeovers. You have so many mechanisms under capitalism to fix these things. It is statism that prevents that. It's the SEC that prevents today bad corporations uh, you know, being taken over by somebody who could run them better. That's who prevents it. And one other thing, the poor being better off, that is a mystery? I mean, empirically? I mean, just think where the poor were 300 years ago. 300 years ago, we were all poor, all of us, all of us. Who do you think created the middle class? Where did the middle class come from? It didn't come from the GI Bill. The middle class was already well established in the United States before the GI Bill. It didn't come from income tax. It came from capitalism. It came from the jobs being created by capitalists, by, by the so-called robber barons, by the industrialists of this country who created real good jobs. It was by Ford who doubled salaries one year because he wanted the best employees in the country. So he doubled the wages that he gave their employees that's the middle class. The middle class were Ford employees, you know, well before the welfare state got in, in, in a place. And the poor in America, if you ever meet a, I, I, I've, I toured through Cambodia once. You want to see poor people? Go to Cambodia. There are no poor people in the United States if those people are poor. It's not on the same stratosphere. It's not on the same planet. Um, just briefly, because I know we have other questions. Um, I just happened to read a, uh, an article that cited a survey of, of CEOs who were asked the question, uh, if you had to choose between good quarterly returns over the next couple quarters or much higher profits five years from now, which would you choose? 70% said good quarterly returns over the next few quarters because the, they, they have a gun to their head and the gun is, is investors and investor groups on Wall Street, and it's not the result of more regulation. It's the result of, of massive amounts of new money coming into equity markets and corporations increasingly in, in, in much more aggressive shareholder groups and you know the, the uh, more, uh, ag aggressive takeovers starting in the 1980s. Very aggressive shareholder uh, actions have, have pushed this short-termism and uh, but just to come back to your, your, your point about what I left out, which is cronyism and bureaucracy, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think that government, like any large institution, has the uh, ability to, to become self-serving and that um, uh, uh, it, it is important to constantly look at how we can reform and streamline. And I do think, by the way, that these public pensions uh, are very problematic in our example of, of, of cronyism because you have the public sector unions that are contributing to the politicians who are setting the pension policies in places like Sacramento and Albany. That is corruption. But isn't and the I position that, you're, you're, that you're, you're standing behind strengthening that and worsening that situation? No, I'm not standing behind trying to strengthen our, our the, the hand of, of uh, public sector unions at all. I think that that's, that's an area where there's a clear need for reform, and I could think of a, a number of other ways to reform government. Yaron and I were, were, were here agreeing that there shouldn't be any, uh, that we shouldn't have all these breaks and special loopholes in our tax system that subsidize different industries, and we need, we need to get rid of all those tax expenditures, and, and that would, and I've argued here as well that, that the campaign finance system uh, which allows corporations and special interests and labor unions to have so much influence over our politicians is a big reason, maybe the big reason, why there's so much cronyism and so much favoritism, and we have to deal with that for sure. Well, let's quickly get through the last three. Okay, this question is primarily directed at David, but I'd be interested to hear your response as well. Uh, you talked about how expensive education is, and you gave examples of the private school in New York and uh, people who want to go to college and can't afford it. But you didn't ever mention why it's expensive. And costs have to come from somewhere. So I would be really interested to hear what you think these costs are and why you think that education is so expensive. OK. Do you want to get another question as well on the table? Yeah, well, actually, actually, why don't we take all three at once? That's okay. probably a good idea. I'm sorry. But, and then we can answer all three at once, but they can answer. Um, I don't know if you can make this brief, but it's about reforming the tax code, which is tens of thousands of pages. How do you keep a tax code from getting that big of a leviathan? And what, would you favor moving in the direction of a consumption tax or keeping with some kind of flat tax? I'd like to hear both of your opinions. 
Okay, so David, you stated earlier that all the law involves the use of force. However, only enforcing a social safety net requires the government to initiate force against its citizens, which is a big distinction. Um, my question is, every thief says that his need justifies his crime. I'm wondering how you would justify yours and what, yours, what makes yours different. <laughs> You, um, you can justify your crimes last if, if you want. <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the first one about college education. Well, education costs. Education costs, sorry. I, I mean, I'll take that. I'm sure David will have something to say about that. I, I mean, I know what, what is driving up costs in education in, in universities, and you can see this by the numbers. The, the fa cost of education is going through the roof. And uh, the number of faculty is, hasn't increased that much. Uh, the amount of teaching that they do hasn't increased at all. It's actually decreased uh, the average amount of hours they spend in the classroom. Uh, what has increased, uh, the amount of number of bureaucrats at our universities has increased dramatically, dramatically over the last 30 years. Huge quantities of new administrators to administer actually a smaller population because the baby boomers who came through the system in the 50s, 60s were much bigger. Uh, second, you're seeing fewer, the professors are teaching less and less, yet their salaries are going up and up. Uh, salaries are going up. Now, why is this happening? Because in a market system, you'd expect there to be pressure on this to stop. It's because government is subsidizing this enormously. So government is writing the tuition checks through loans who pretty much anybody can qualify for, the huge number of loans. And I think today, most students believe they won't have to pay these loans back because Obama's hinted that there's some amnesty program down the road. So why not amass $200,000 worth of loans? And of course, their money goes, anything, I mean, this is the principle. Anything government buys, guess what happens to cost? Goes up. When they buy health care, cost goes up. When they buy education, the cost goes up. But in the, in the high school level, I mean, it's, it, the zoning requirements, that I, I was involved in some private schools locally here. The ability to find a location and find the right location and the zoning and the, 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 the city control that they want. And, and yet, I, again, I was involved in private schools here. You could run a school at pretty reasonable rates. Way below, I don't, you know, New York City, maybe 30,000, but way below 30,000 in Southern California, which is not a cheap place. What you don't have, you don't have a fancy football field. You know? You don't have the fanciest gym in the world. You don't have an indoor swimming pool, which a lot of public schools have. But you know what? You have great teachers who are really motivated and who uh, excite the students to learn, which I think what schooling is mostly about. <clears throat> That's on that one. Yeah, I want to take up the tax reform issue because I think it's a, it's a good question. And it also goes to the question of subsidies and uh, corporate welfare. Uh, you know, I, I think Yaron and I would both agree that that major tax reform is a good idea and that the 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 specific idea of a consumption atta uh, tax which the, the 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 questioner mentioned i think is a is a great idea i think that in general we should try to go for big tax reform so that we tax things like consumption and things like pollution we don't tax good things like work and investing in wealth creation. If we could have a tax system that taxes consumption and taxes pollution and didn't tax those, those uh, positive behaviors, I, I think that we would have more prosperity. And I think it'd also be harder to, to engage in tax evasion. Yaron and I would have some differences as to how that, how that might be done. Uh, I would want to continue seeing progressivity in the, in the tax system. And, the question of progressivity uh, brings me to the question of how would I, how do I justify my crimes? Uh, you know, progressivity is basically a, a progressive tax system, which we've had in this country for almost a century, is basically a form of, of redistribution, right? People who are uh, who, who make higher incomes pay a bigger share than people who who have lower incomes, and this is a system which has uh, allowed us to generate a tremendous amount of revenue to invest in the foundations of prosperity and also to provide a, a strong social safety net in the form of Social Security and Medicare and other other things. And it's a system that has been has been strongly supported by the majority of Americans. You know, I started this this started this discussion tonight by saying government is us. Government is is what we choose to do together and we choose to solve how we choose, we use government as a tool to solve certain problems that we can't solve individually and that 
the market can't solve by itself. And perhaps Iran is right. Maybe the market can solve certain problems that government is is now taking on. Maybe others, you know, uh, it, it, it can't solve. Or maybe there's some more areas for for civil society. I, I'm certainly open to having other actors solve problems. I'm open to having government working collaboratively, as it oft, often has historically worked with business to to do uh, big things. Um, and but regardless, the point is is that these are policies that we have chosen together as a as a country through a democratic process with lots of checks and balances. It's not, uh, you know, just some random putting a gun to somebody's head. And by and large, by the way, this system of mixed government, progressive taxes, strong social safety net has worked. We have become the richest, most successful. Uh, powerful nation in the history of the world, largely with this model over the past 80 years. So, you know, to say, oh, this model is 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 horrible and terrible, and let's substitute the model we have of mixed of a mixed economy with some completely radical, utopian, untested, never tried in any country in any place at any point in history. Let's replace the system we have, which has worked so well, with this. Uh, alternative utopian vision, I think, is deeply naive and dangerous. That, that sounded suspiciously like a closing statement. <laughs> uh, so, Iran, if you want to take sure. a very brief closing statement, and then we'll end it. So, I, I think the fundamental difference, I mean, just came, came out, I think. And that is the way we view coercion. I view forcing people to do things they don't want as wrong. Wrong, always. The initiation of force is always wrong. And yes, we've created lots of mechanisms to make it seem appealing. We have local communities and we vote and then we send representatives and they vote and we make it, we make it touchy-feely, we make it feel good. We have decided to coerce you. <laughs> it's true, we have. No, we, we deserve the politicians we have. We deserve the laws that we have because we, David's absolutely right, most of the American people like this system. They want this system. They think it's okay to coerce people by majority rule. I'm saying it's wrong. I'm saying the system is inherently morally corrupt. And if something is inherently morally corrupt, it will also go bust. It's just a matter of time, and I believe we're heading there. We became the greatest, mightiest industrial power in the history of the world from a backward colony during the 100 years in which we were the freest we've ever been. The period from 1776, 140 years, until the, the break of World War I, when we established ourselves clearly as the strongest country in the world. That is the period where we were most free, not as free as I would like us to be, but the most free we've ever been. That is when we grew, that's when the wealth was created. We've been cruising since then, luckily, you know, with ever-growing state involvement in our life, with ever-growing government impeding on our freedoms. We're going to pay for it. The day is coming. You know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but it's coming. I don't know when. We're seeing a little bit of it right now. But the point is that that's where we created the wealth, not post-Great Depression. Post-Great Depression has been a mess. Yeah, we've done well because we still left parts of our economy free. But the key issue, again, is the issue of does democracy, does a system, does us justify force? And in my view, it never does, uh, and it never should. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, that, that concludes our debate. Uh, please remember to stay uh, for the reception. Uh, both authors will be uh, uh, selling and presumably signing, if necessary, their books.